and today we are speaking to Lord Robert Rennick, who was the ambassador, British ambassador to South Africa at the time of the democratic transition. His new book is called Mission to South Africa, Diary of a Revolution, and it covers that period. Welcome to the Mail Guardian. Um, Robin, you, it's, it's called Diary of a Revolution, but you didn't exactly keep a diary during all those difficult years. I didn't yeah. keep a diary with a lot of content, <coughs> but I did obviously keep one which, uh, which recorded the dates of my meetings with, mm -hmm. with, with a lot of private meetings with P.W. Botha, usually quite stormy uh, meetings with F.W. de Klerk in the run-up to the release of Mandela, and then after that, a lot of private meetings with Mandela and de Klerk. Um, but I didn't write the book earlier because obviously some of this could be sensitive still for people still around. Uh, but also, I didn't have access to all the records of these meetings. Now, the Foreign Office decided that they were going to open up the archives and let me print all this stuff, including all the Downing Street uh, records at the time. So, there is a lot of new material in this in this book. Mm -hmm. uh, there's quite a lot of uh, toing and froing between uh, various people. Uh, quite a uh, large role for uh, Mrs. Thatcher. In, in the negotiation process in pushing for Mandela's release? Well, she so. certainly pressed very hard. I mean, one of the illusions which the book ought to shatter is any idea that she was a friend of apartheid. She, she thought apartheid was nuts. You know, she thought it was, uh, it made no sense from an economic point of view. It alienated the Indian colored and black elites in this country. If, in, you know, she was a meritocrat, so if she believed as somebody succeeded in life, why shouldn't they live where they want to or do what they want to and so on. So that was an illusion and what it does demonstrate uh, very clearly is that no other head of government attacked this problem the way she did, which was not just by making statements in their own parliament about, you know, must release Mandela and apartheid. Uh, she sent, she bombarded P.W. Bota with messages about what needed to be done next, really annoying him and I was in the middle of these exchanges with him and he constantly said to me, you know, you must stop interfering in our affairs and so on. Then with de Klerk, she, again, she, she engaged very, very intensively with de Klerk because she did believe that de Klerk, you know, offered the opportunity for something completely different. Mm. And I note uh, that you say uh, she never said Mandela was a terrorist or the ANC were terrorists, which is one of those quotes no, that actually, come up quite frequently. No, actually, about the ANC, that's not quite right. She, she's accused of having called Mandela a terrorist. She never called Mandela a terrorist. And when she did at long last meet Mandela, he had exactly the same effect on her as he did on everybody else. You know, he, here's this tall, dignified, very courteous, uh, old world, you know, person with obvious great presence, magnanimity and so on, she was extremely impressed and she ended up as a, a, you know, a pretty unconditional supporter of Mandela, though not at the expense of her, her admiration for de Klerk, because she thought de Klerk had made all this possible. But she remained a skeptic about the ANC. She, she knew, and I had told her many times, and she did uh, listen to advice on this, that there wasn't going to be any solution possible in South Africa without the ANC, but she didn't like two-thirds of the Politburo being communists, she didn't like the attacks on soft targets, she didn't like the necklacing of collaborators. Mm -hmm. Now speaking about uh, F.W. de Klerk, um, this seems recently, perhaps because we're coming up to the 25th anniversary of the, the unbannings um, of February the 2nd, 1990, that mm -hmm. uh, there seems to have been a bit of a backlash in South Africa against de Klerk, kind of saying, oh, he was not, you know, not such a great guy, didn't deserve the Peace Prize, didn't really do anything, um, and that deep down he was kind of an unreconstructed uh, Afrikaner nationalist. Well, the backlash comes from two groups, doesn't it? It comes from the left, and it also comes from some right-wingers who think that he, you know, gave up much too soon, he should have got a better deal for the Afrikaners, and so on. At a time when, <clears throat> on one occasion, after, when he was president, uh, and I was no longer ambassador, but I was visiting, uh, Mandela made some statement that you know, he preferred dealing with P.W. Borta, who was more straightforward than with de Klerk. That was egged on by the ANC. I went mm -hmm. to see Mandela in his small office in the Toyn House in Cape Town. And I said, I used to 
When I used to walk into this office to see P.W. Gorter, it was to argue for people's lives. And he was the person responsible for the death squads, the Civil Corporation Bureau, flat class unit, you know, taking people out. So please remember that. And not only that, I argued with him many times for your release, and he had no intention of releasing you until you were at death's door, because he knew that the moment he did release you, um, the situation would be out of control. And as for de Klerk, please remember that but for de Klerk, you might still be in jail. And Mandela immediately, of course, burst out laughing, and he said, turned to his sidekick and said, the ambassador is right, he said. <laughs> and not only that, he said to me, de Klerk richly deserved his Nobel Peace Prize because he was the person who made peace possible.